Welcome to another episode of Reaching for My Roots, the podcast that delves deeper into the fascinating stories of our ancestral connections. Today, I look into the fascinating life of my maternal second cousin, Sir Clary Harders, from his humble beginnings to his pivotal role in shaping Australia's legal landscape. Join me as I explore the extraordinary career of a man whose legacy endures to this day and who found himself at the heart of one of Australia's biggest political storms in the 1970s. Brace yourselves for a tale filled with adventure, perseverance, and a hint of rebellion as I uncover the twists and turns of his involvement in a clandestine borrowing scheme, his role in the nation's economic crisis, and the gripping events that led to the dismissal of the Whitlam government. This is a saga you won't want to miss. Before I get to that, though, I have to go back to the early 1800s, a time when Europe was ablaze with religious fervor and political unrest. In the midst of this tumultuous era, the story begins with Heinrich Harders, a young man hailing from the vibrant town of Cottbus in the Brandenburg region of Germany. Born with an insatiable thirst for freedom and a steadfast Lutheran faith, Heinrich made a daring decision that would change the course of his family's destiny forever. At the tender age of 23, Heinrich bid farewell to his homeland, a fractured Germany yet to be united. His destination? The distant shores of Australia, a land brimming with untold promise and boundless opportunities. But Heinrich's motivations ran deeper than mere ambition. He sought respite from the religious persecution that plagued his beloved Germanic states, where Lutherans like himself faced an uphill battle against oppression. Fast forward to the year 1915 in the picturesque town of Matoa in Victoria. It's here that our protagonist, Clarence Voldemar Harders, takes his first breath. The second of four children and the eldest son of locally born parents, Ernest Wilhelm Harders and his wife Meta Evelyn Nee Mibus. Young Clarence entered a world on the cusp of great change. Clary, as his friends and family affectionately called him, and his relationship to myself can be traced to Amelia Harders, my great-grandmother, who was a first cousin of his father, Ernest. In 1926, when Clary's life took a tragic turn with the passing of his father due to influenza, shortly thereafter, he embarked on a new chapter relocating to the vibrant city of Adelaide. Clary's education at Concordia College laid the groundwork for his future endeavours, leading him to the University of Adelaide. In December 1943, he was admitted as a legal practitioner of the Supreme Court of South Australia, but destiny had other plans. The eruption of World War II disrupted his educational pursuits. In response to the call of duty, he joined the citizen military forces and was enlisted for full-time duty in March 1942, ultimately transitioning to the Australian Imperial Force. Rising through the ranks to Staff Sergeant, he dedicated himself to defending the South Australian lines of communication area until his honourable discharge in March 1944. Following his military service, Hart has embarked on a new chapter as a prosecutor in the Crown Solicitor's Office in Adelaide, an integral part of the Commonwealth Attorney General's Department. In a serendipitous turn of events, he found loving goddess Lillian Treasure, whom he married in 1947. Gladys, a former shop assistant and a clerk in the Australian Women's Army Service, became an integral part of Clary's journey. In 1949, a significant turning point occurred when Harder secured a position at the central office of the Commonwealth Attorney General's Department in Canberra. The following years witnessed his ascent within the department's ranks culminating in his appointment as the Secretary in 1970. Harders played a pivotal role in expanding the department's policy responsibilities, spearheading a wave of legislative and law reform initiatives that shaped Australia's legal landscape. Throughout his tenure as a Secretary, Clary would work tirelessly to establish groundbreaking institutions that would leave an indelible mark on Australia's legal framework his collaboration with attorneys general from across the political spectrum, including Sir Garfield Barwick and Lionel Murphy, 
as well as his close relationship with Prime Minister Gough Whitman, facilitated the establishment of pivotal bodies such as the Family Court of Australia, the Federal Court of Australia and the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. Harry Harders was no stranger to turbulent times and he found himself at the epicentre of major crises, including the infamous Loans Affair and the subsequent deferral of supply by the Senate. In these challenging moments, he showcased his resilience and unwavering commitment to upholding the law. His involvement in landmark legal cases such as the nuclear test case and the seas and submerged lands case further solidified his reputation as a legal luminary. By the time 1974 rolled around, Clary, a man of slight stature but formidable intellect, found himself at meetings that would shape the destiny of a nation. With the Prime Minister, Attorney General and other officials, Harders was embroiled in discussions about a proposed overseas borrowing scheme from an irregular source. Little did he know that his actions would catapult him into the centre of a political firestorm. Harders, the legal mastermind, passionately advocated for the inclusion of the Department of the Treasury in these secretive talks. He recognised the gravity of the situation and was instrumental in preparing the Executive Council minutes, seeking approval for substantial borrowings to avert an impending economic crisis. While the scheme was eventually abandoned, its existence sparked accusations of impropriety that would send shockwaves throughout the nation. In the scorching Australian summer of 1975, the stage was set for a dramatic showdown. Harders, along with a select group of senior officials, was summoned before the bar of the Senate to testify about their involvement in the borrowing scheme. Instructed by the government to claim privilege, these individuals stood at a precipice torn between loyalty and transparency. Looking back, Harders reflected on the path untaken. He believed it would have been wiser to testify, revealing the truth behind the government's actions. While he later questioned some of the loan-raising procedures, he staunchly rejected allegations of a conspiracy to deceive the Governor-General. But destiny has a way of turning the tides. 1975 is the year I was born and the year Allied involvement in the Vietnam conflict ended. However, November 11 was forever etched in Australia's history as a day of reckoning. Sir John Kerr, the Governor-General, took a fateful step and dismissed the government of then Prime Minister Gough Whitlam. In a surprising twist, Hardis found himself advising Whitlam one moment and counselling the caretaker Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser, formerly of the opposition, the next. The nation stood on a precipice of uncertainty. Hardis received a call from Whitlam the following day seeking assistance in the turmoil. However, duty bound him to serve the new government leaving Whitlam adrift. In his retirement, Hardis publicly expressed his reservations about the Governor-General's use of power, questioning the manner in which he handed the Prime Minister a letter without prior consultation. Hardis emphasised the importance of frankness and the duty to advise and warn. Beyond the political battlefield, Sir Clary Hardis was a man of integrity, driven by a commitment to public service and professional ethics. Honoured with an Order of the British Empire in 1969 and knighted in 1977, he was known for his humble demeanour and sharp intellect. Despite these accolades, Hardis preferred to be addressed simply as Clary rather than Sir Clarence, a testament to his approachability and down-to-earth nature. After retiring from his political career in 1979, he embarked on a captivating journey as a legal advisor to the Department of Foreign Affairs, immersing himself in the intricacies of international law. Just as that chapter closed, another opened, whisking him away to the vibrant realm of a leading private law firm, Freehill, Hollingdale and Page. For a span of nine years, he delved deep into the realms of litigation, conquering legal battles with unwavering determination. It was during this time that fate intertwined his path with that of Murphy, a distinguished High Court judge caught in the jaws of a scandalous charge of attempting to pervert the course of justice. Like a legal virtuoso, though, 
very skillfully donned the cloak of a defender, orchestrating a remarkable victory in the courtroom. His brilliance shone not only through his legal endeavours, but also as an occasional commentator, casting his astute observations on matters of public law, captivating audiences with his insights. In the tapestry of his life, he found solace in the embrace of his loving wife and their cherished children, a son and two daughters, a testament to the legacy he had woven. Unfortunately, the hands of time eventually dealt a blow with his passing on the 22nd of February 1997 in Canberra. As his body returned to the elements, a poignant memorial service was held at the Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Lyons, echoing with heartfelt tributes and remembrances of a life that had left an indelible mark on the world of law and beyond. So that's the story of my second cousin, Sir Clary Harders, or just Clary as he liked to be known. He really did put a big mark on the Australian political and legal landscapes that goes well beyond what I've been able to tell you now. Could be here for hours, there's just so much he did. He, he really did leave a huge legacy behind him and many of the um, things he put in place are still being used by the Australian government and the legal fraternity to this day, which is just huge and speaks volumes for what he was able to do with his life. So that's, he's a great Australian and he's a relative of mine and I'm really proud of what he's achieved, regardless of what my political persuasions are. I reckon it's a great story and he's a great man. Thanks for listening and I'll be back soon with another episode.